Hi, everyone. My name is Josh Rosenstein. I'm going to be presenting today on permaculture ideology, capitalism, and an exit strategy. What kind of edible landscaping business do you want to build? Um, my edible landscaping business is called Edible Eden Baltimore Foodscapes. It is completing its ninth year of operations, and we serve the Baltimore metropolitan area. I'm going to share, first of all, I just want to say how excited I am to be presenting at this conference, because one thing that I'm very clear on is it's been a little bit of a, a lonely grind over the past nine years, and I'm super excited to see this industry start to actually um, get its feet and grow. And this seems like exactly the kind of thing that's going to be building the industry, maybe building my competition, and um, building a network of people committed to doing this kind of work. So I'm really excited to be a part of it. So let's dive in. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on who I am and where I'm coming from to this work. Then we're going to dive a little bit deeper into what Edible Eden does and how we do it, how we organize it, what some of the tech tools that we use to accomplish it. And I'm going to be, my intention is to be, um, you know, honest about some of the real challenges that we have come across and, and the ways that we've grappled with them. Um, and then I want to wrap up by just sharing some of the big picture numbers and details of how the business has grown. And that's where I'll wrap up. So. Like I said, my name is Josh. I'm a half and half Israeli American. I grew up moving back and forth between those two different places. Um, my first identity and, and, and plan was to be a traveling guitar hippie. So I was definitely going for more of a counterculture lifestyle. Um, I did wind up going to college at the Evergreen State College and I got a degree in anthropology and writing and then spent the next five years proving to myself and to the world that I could make a living as a writer even though they say it's really hard, it is really hard. Um, but you know, after doing that for a while, I got divorced, I was in my early 30s, and I was really um, reevaluating, really, what I was doing in the world and what my career looked like. And I wanted to do something that was earthier, um, that was more grounded, and that was a part of the solution. Um, and it was around about that time that permaculture kind of came across my radar. I had I put myself in a position where I was really open to my next thing without knowing what that thing was. And a woman who I'd met at a festival called me up and said, hey, have you ever heard of permaculture? And I said, well, I'm not sure. And she said, well, I need you to go take this PDC and uh, then show up and you can be my intern. So that's where I started studying permaculture was out in the Pacific Northwest. I got my uh, first PDC from the, um, from the Bullock Brothers out in Locust Island, which is a spectacular place. And um, then had the opportunity to really deepen that, doing some intern work out in the Pacific Northwest Islands. And subsequently came to the East Coast, worked for a bunch of um, edible and, or sorry, a bunch of uh, nonprofit educational programs focused on, focusing on organic farming and sustainable design. And that brings me up to starting the business. So I'm just going to show you a few slides at this point of what my current circumstance are. So I recommend if you were going to start an edible landscaping business and you were, say, 24 and single, that's the best time to start an edible landscaping business. <laughs> um, this is my reality. I have a two-year-old and a six-year-old. And um, my wife, Terry, is a social worker who works in the inner city schools and has a very, very full-time job. Um, and I'm not going to lie to you, that's that's a big part of the equation for us, like the realities of of small children and family life while trying to manage a small business is definitely um, a piece of the, of the picture. One of the really sweet parts of it is the opportunity to just share this stuff with, with your kids, right? Here's Malachi and I digging potatoes, which is always a highlight with young kids. Um, <laughs> here he is learning how to pick spinach, showing us his sunflower. And here's Raphael modeling um, Edible Eden's newest hat. So. Yeah, it's it's. I guess the the bottom line there is that it really does. I, I really do think it makes sense to think about where you're at in life and what your needs of your business are um, in crafting a plan for what it looks like. So from there, I want to just share you know what Edible Eden looks like and what it is that we do. So Edible Eden Baltimore Foodscapes designs, installs, and maintains food gardens and edible and ecological landscapes for homeowners, businesses, and schools. I could add to that around the Baltimore metropolitan area. Um, I just want to flag our vehicles. I really love our vehicles. Um, it costs about fifteen hundred bucks here to uh, to wrap one of the cars here with one of these partial wraps, 
And I have to say that along with website and word of mouth, um, people seeing the vehicles is a big, a big uh, driver for uh, new customers. I'm going to talk a lot about the team. Um, I think I want to introduce that now. So I mentioned that I'd come from the nonprofit world. Right? I worked at all these educational farms, and I came to, uh, to feel that you know, these top, hot, top heavy nonprofits with, you know, boards telling the people what to do and fundraising and a lot of overhead. It just, it felt to me like small business had the potential to present a more nimble and a more impactful approach um, to the world's challenges. And that's really why I got into Edible Eden, right? I set out with Edible Eden to build a business that had a triple bottom line. And yes, I took this from permaculture and I want to come back to that in a minute. Right, the business that I set out to build takes care of the earth, takes care of the people, and generates a profit. I know, I can see what you're thinking. You're thinking, wait a minute, Josh, I know the permaculture ethics. Yeah, it takes care of the earth, and then it takes care of the people, and then it redistributes the surplus, right? Or if you you know follow Holmgren's uh, principles, it, it's or ethics, it's fair share, right? Neither of those say profit. And, and I do want to flag that because I think as I get, get into some of these details with the business, you'll see that there is actually some cognitive dissonance there. Like what it is that I have sought to do is to take an ideals-based business idea, right? Something that is supposed to be good for the world and that is supposed to be idealism-based and that's supposed to impact bugs and bees and birds and butterflies. And... I'm seeking to, to do that in a for-profit capitalist environment. And the capitalist environment that we're talking about, guys, the, the capitalist paradigm in which the landscaping industry exists, guys, flat out, it is predicated on exploitation. That's what it is built on. That's how the pricing structures are set up. Um, and permaculture is trying to not do that. Right. So I do want to flag that as being a real um, there's some cognitive dissonance there. There's some real challenge there. And I think that's something that I have struggled with and continue to struggle with. And when you get into the nuance of running an edible landscaping business at this size, which is, you know, like a small to mid medium size, um, those questions, th that's really where the rubber meets the road. And, and I'm going to come back to that later in the presentation. But first, let, let's just walk through what it is that we do and how we do. Um, this is our team at a really cool inner city um, job we had the opportunity to do. Someone got a grant and we were able to go in and create some actual planters in food desert and then share some tips and tricks for, for growing food to folks that, you know, could really use it. It's another one of our vehicles. So I want to start with our annuals team. Edible Eden is broken into three departments. And this is something that you may or may not choose to do, but I, I think it's actually really uh interesting and relevant to how, how you choose to set up your business. So we have it set up in three departments. The annuals team, I'm going to talk about that first because that really is where we started out, right? Annuals is about backyard farming. It's about growing vegetables in suburban or urban small spaces. Um, for us, that looks like maintaining veggie gardens, operating veggie gardens, um, backyard farming, as well as the educational program associated with that. And I'm going to show you some really cool slides about our garden coach program. It really is, for me, one of the more exciting parts of what we do, where we're actually meeting people and growing their skill set and empowering them to have you know, more um, direct relationships to their food source. Um, over the winter this year, we are pioneering some new products within our annuals department. We're growing Garden Club, which has been uh, a small thing, but we're trying to get it to be a virtual option as well. We're looking at selling curated garden kits of materials, and we're really growing out our educational curriculum, which I'm going to share a little more a bit about in a few minutes here. Um, guys, we grow some really beautiful produce. Um, you know, some of our gardens are just really spectacular. Here's an example of garden coach at play, right? Our garden, our lead garden coach, Jamie, is is coaching some uh, clients on a new garden, what it looks like to plant cool season crops, what to look for, etc. Um, again, there's just a lot. It's, it's very mission centric, right? It's really like deeply in alignment with what it is that we set ourselves up to do, right? To teach people how to grow food, to meet them where they're at, um, to provide the infrastructure and the materials for them so that they can really get into it. 
Um, and here's an example of our Garden Coach uh, curriculum documents, and we are currently using Calendly to set up those Garden Coach um, appointments. Um, these are made by Emily Castle, our, um, our annual's lead and marketing uh, support person, and she's just incredibly talented. So you can see here, this is uh, the first six of year one, and we have these for two straight years. The, the second year gets more deep dive into more nuanced stuff. And the idea is that at the beginning of the season, you get a binder, and then each month you get your, your curriculum handout. This is all definitely stuff that we could pull together into a book or you know, use in all sorts. Of, it's, it's great content that we could use in different ways. Um, these are just examples of you know, what this looks like. You know, we've had those peak experiences of dad and daughter learning how to you know, harvest potatoes and kids picking peas. And um, this is at a rooftop at a rooftop apartment complex garden that we have that's been really great. Um, we started out using some prefabbed um, beds from like gardeners, like this truck. Subsequently, we've developed our own, but we still have some of those out there. And here's Emily showcasing one of our one of our um, biggest and most exciting gardens. This is the kind of stuff that I would like to be doing more of. Although there are definitely financial questions, which we'll talk to at the end of what it means to do like a thirty thousand dollar garden with multiple beds and trellises and gravel and, and uh, in-ground patches and perennials versus, you know, just a couple of smaller things. Um, and, you know, no presentation on annuals would be complete without a little bit of veg born. We've got some beautiful kales and carrot root crops and lettuces. Um, okay, here's the thing, the dark underbelly of the annuals department. We have two and a half people working in this department. All the things I said about it are true. Earlier this year, we had the opportunity to actually separate out the departments in QuickBooks using the class function. And this was incredibly um, enlightening for me. You know, all these years I've been trying to figure out how come my business doesn't make any money, right? Well, it's because the annuals department. <laughs> the, um, the builds department and the perennials department are both associated with viable business margins. The annuals department, you know, was just gushing money. I mean, it just, it is not a financially viable business plan. And that may be because of the fundamental business plan, which we can get into a little bit more. And that may be because of, you know, me coming to this, not necessarily being a business person, right? I mean, I think I skimmed over this at the beginning, but I started out of bleeding with like a shovel and a 20 year old pickup truck, right? Like there was no startup capital. This was definitely a bootstrap operation. And there are some things that I'm better at than others. And, you know, business is not necessarily a background that I'm coming from. So I've done a lot of things that just kind of like, oh, let's try it and see what happens. And so we found ourselves in the situation where the annuals department had two and a half full-time staff. Our product was getting ever deeper, ever more nuanced, ever more valuable, right? We send out these beautiful reports at the end of every visit. And we have all these nuanced organic treatment stuff that we do. And we have all these seedlings coming from different directions at different sizes and varieties and ways of interacting with the customer. And, you know, it was gushing money. Like it was going to lose $50,000 or something by the end of the year. So Emily did this very impressive forensic analysis, which I continue to be in awe of. She took every single garden, of which there are somewhere in the 30s, and she really took a magnifying glass and got into exactly what it cost us to take care of them, right? How, many how much time are we actually at the garden? What about drive time? What about fuel? What about plants? What about ma other materials spread out over the year, right? really dialing in for each garden because it turns out there's a huge difference between a, a two raised bed garden five minutes from the shop and like six and a half raised beds an hour's drive from the shop right and that was not captured in our costing structure at all so um i want to highlight two of the the particularly challenging things to incorporate into this into this um task was realistically calculating overhead Right? And there's different ways of doing that. I do want to share the two ways that I thought about it because it really changed my perspective. So what I first did is I, I, the blunt instrument impact, right? I took a, an ax and I just chopped up the overhead into three baskets. And the overhead was everything, include our rent, right? The rent, the commercial rent for where, where the business is based out of, all the costs associated with the vehicles, the insurances, the permits, the admin time, any salary that I was going to get, really everything that was not directly billable into specific jobs. And I just hacked that up into three. I just divided it three ways and, and tagged each department with that. And if you do that, then annuals looks like it is literally, I mean, we just need to like shut it down, 
right? It's just, it's, you know, a bottom line of negative $50,000. Then I got a little bit of coaching and a little bit of advice and learned that actually the more strategic way of calculating overhead is in proportion to the amount of revenue it brings in. And annuals brings in, you know, less than half, a third um, of the revenue associated with builds or, or perennials, right? So when I did it like that, when I took the overhead and then tagged each department with overhead in proportion to the, in percentage to the amount of revenue they brought in, annuals was a lot closer to breaking even, still losing money, but closer to breaking even. And so what Emily did is she basically calculated what we would need to charge in order to make it a viable business, and then came up with some numbers that made, you know, like nosebleed numbers that made us all feel a little green about on the gills. And then one way that we did, one, one thing that we brought to that is rather than having people sign a nine month contract, which is the gardening season in Maryland, we are now asking people to sign a 12 month contract. Because the fact is that if we're not gonna get rid of all the staff at the end of every gardening season, we gotta keep paying them over the winter and there's no money coming in. And that is, I think, an Achilles heel in this climate of this type of business. And one of our approaches to fixing that was to say, look, guys, we need you to sign a 12 month contract. You're gonna, you're gonna, and, and to spread the ultimate number that we needed to charge over those 12 months. So first of all, it looks a lot closer, if not even a little less than what they were paying before. It's just that there's an extra three months of bill, right? Um, but also, um, we really broke out for them. We, we put together these really beautiful packages that broke down all of the value that we were currently bringing to the table and, and highlighted it, right? There's like 12 or 15 things that we're doing. Everything from like testing the soil to, um, you know, a personalized uh, garden planning session at the beginning of the season to the off season work that we do to generate the garden plans and source the materials and figure out the schedules. Um, and we put that all out there to the customers. We said, look, this is basically the reality. This is what it is that we're providing. And this is what we need to charge in order to stay afloat. And at the time of this presentation, we are a little bit walking on eggshells, um, waiting to find out how many of the 30 something customers or gardens that we serviced last year are gonna come back at those rates. And my guess is that we will lose somewhere in the vicinity of 50% of them. But our challenge and our opportunity is, okay, great. We know that we can break even, if not better, if we have 30 gardens paying these rates, as well as fix our January crisis, right? Because we're going to start charging in January. And, um, and so our opportunity and our challenge is to go out and market and get another, whatever that is, 15 or 20 customers. Um, and if we can do that, then we actually have an annuals department that holds financial water. So I'm gonna stop there on annuals and move on to our builds team. Our builds team is, to be honest, currently predicated on one person named Tony, who's just you know one of those people that is tremendously talented and can, you know, we can go look at a job and I can say, hey, I want to build this thing that has this pergola and that has this fence and that has these beds. And Tony goes away and then he comes back and figures it out and it looks great. So having if you can't do that, having someone on your team that can do do that seems like a valuable thing. On the other hand, I think it's probably possible to build a business with, you know, prefab kits or, you know, purchase plans as long as they work. Um, and in some ways, by having all this custom design stuff, you know, we're constantly in that question of are we charging enough to make uh, to make it all make sense. So, um, yeah, we, raise, we build our garden, our beds have been improving every year for nine years, our deer fences, trellises, urban planters, irrigation systems. And, you know, as you can see here, every year we come up with new stuff that we start doing. In this case, we've really upped our blueberry cage and critter cage stuff. We've uh, pioneered a new tomato planter that's a little bit more affordable, you know, stuff like that. So here's some just visuals of what it looks like. Um, this is our high end fence. Talk to me before you start offering fences like this, because there's a lot of things that can go wrong. But, you know, this is cattle panel framed in treated lumber. And this is the kind of beds we build out of two by six cedar. Um, here's an example of one of our salad tables, uh, as opposed to that truck I showed you earlier. Um, here are some new creative solutions to hectic squirrel, bird, and groundhog um, challenges. 
Um, the micro farm is one of uh, one of the part one of the things that we build that I really appreciate. It was originally made to go. It's it was four foot by four foot, and the idea was for many of those people buying townhomes with sixteen foot across corrupted concrete backyards in the city. One of these fits in the corner. Two of them flanks the backyard, and if you put a connecting piece between it, you know you have a turnkey, three layers of grow space in what was previously just concrete um, or contaminated soil. So, you know, as you can see, we've got the 12 inches of depth on the bottom for smaller crops and the 24 inches on the back for taller crops and then the trellis behind it for climbing crops. Um, we do a lot of these two tier beds, which um, frankly just look cool. Um, we are often called upon to build things into slopes. So we have different ways of doing terraces around that. This is a cool strawberry tower um, we, and by me, I, we, I mean Tony designed. Um, and then, you know, regularly we get people that ask us to do stuff that hasn't been done before, and that's when we're kind of coming up with a custom design. So you can't really see them here, but there's three salad tables behind here, so, and there's a path between them. So you have like all your deep rooted crops protected from the deer, and then you have all these tables for herbs and salads, which have little coverings up top. Um, cattle panels are your friend, man. Find a source for cattle panels because they make great trellises, deer fences, hooped trellises, which are super cool. Um, and then this is an example of how we do brambles or raspberries per se. We build, you know, trellis posts and use coated cable to support them. Um, and we have really tried to get more commercial clients. I'll be honest with you. It's, it's a lot harder, I find, to get commercial clients. And I don't know. I've, I found it harder to retain. Like this, these places, they, you know, after the first year of service, they were just like, uh, we're putting out of money. We're going to do it on our own. And just like walked out of their contract. Um, this restaurant with these uh, smart pots were a great herb garden for them. They went out of business. So, you know, there is something to be said for residential clients, for better and for worse. And we can talk about that more at the end. Um, here's Ryan. You know, we do a lot of R&D, right? I'll say, hey, we need to do this thing. And they'll figure out how to build it. And then we'll try it out and see how it goes and then tweak it. So in this case, this is a, a, a new pilot for a blueberry cage you know, that looks good in the landscape, that lasts for a while, and that you can actually get in there to harvest the blueberries, but still keep the birds out, which I don't know if you've tried to net blueberries before, but that's actually not super easy. Um, one of the cool things we do, uh, we've done for the past few years, is put on a show at the Maryland Home and Garden Show. Um, we don't do a ton of marketing, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that at the end, but we do rally to put on this Maryland Home and Garden Show, and we've gotten some really great customers out of it. And I and to a certain degree, I think it's just kind of a cool thing to do to come together and put all of our materials, you know, mocked up with straw and plants inside in this big warehouse and then have the public walk by and be able to talk to them about them. So that was that was pretty cool. So getting into the perennials team, this is the third leg of the business, right? So we've got the annuals taking care of the gardens, we've got the builds building the infrastructure, and now perennials designs and install fruit and berry installations puts in ecological landscapes and pollinator gardens and native gardens, and meadow style plantings, and then, you know, offers maintenance, which it turns out perennials maintenance is kind of the opposite side of the spectrum from annuals maintenance. There's not that many moving parts. They don't cost very much and you can charge top dollar for it. So, you know, knee jerk, if I was starting from scratch, I think perennials maintenance might be the best margins that you could actually get into inedible landscaping. I mean, all you're buying is mulch and perennial plants, right? And if you have a good wholesale nursery, those are somewhat negligible. But one of the things that we're really hoping to up our game with and really grow into uh, is the really dialed in specialized care to fruits and berries. Like, it's one thing to say like, yeah, we only plant these varieties of apple trees in this climate because we think they're gonna have the best disease resistant package. But it's another thing to come and say, look, you know, within the OMRI certified certifications we have a spray package for you know monthly biannually quarterly and everything in between um, and we can really support you homeowner in actually being able to realize that holy grail of like beautiful hand friendly fruit growing right in your backyard um, i do want to say depending on where you're coming to this from you know obviously things are going to look really different in maryland it's really hard to grow fruit right i mean it's not for the weak of heart we uh <laughs> Yeah, you've got all the pests and the diseases of the north, and you've got all the funguses and the blights of the south, and they all kind of overlap right here. So 
it's a whole lot easier to buy something at the Home Depot and to fail miserably than it is to source, you know, a disease resistant variety, plant it appropriately, take care of it appropriately, and realize that beautiful harvest. Um, and that's really one of the things that we're, you know, growing into setting us up, setting ourselves up for and looking to to represent as like, yeah, you've tried it by yourself and you failed. So now bring in the people who really know what they're doing. And, and that's, you know, at least in my head, one of the things that justifies the kind of costs that we're currently charging um, when we come out to your house and take care of your fruit trees. So one thing that Sarah, Sarah is the perennials lead and another very powerful individual. Um, one thing that she did when she came on and, you know, also inherited a department that was losing a ton of money and, you know, heard from me like, I don't know, what are we going to do? We got to fix it. Um, she created this tool, which I think is, genius. Um, and that's really also fed into what Emily did with her forensic analysis. So what Sarah did here is she created a tool that seeks to capture everything that that customer has, which is always going to be different, and then generates the numbers that we need to charge to make it all add sense, uh, all, all add up. So she, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you can see this really clearly, but, you know, on the very far left of the thing is what it is that might have. Is it a small tree? Is it a medium tree? Is it a blueberry bush? Is it a bramble run? Um, there's a cap, there's an area here for just hourly, right? If we're just weeding or what have you. Um, then she's got it broken down into four visits because we don't generally offer more than four visits. We could do biannual, we could do quarterly, and for a special customer, we could do monthly, but that would be a specialized, customized quote. So in this case, she's able to just tick off, okay, they have two small trees and we're going to do an opening visit we're going to do a mid-season visit, we're going to do a second mid-season visit, and then a closing visit, and it spits out at the end what we need to charge to actually cover those materials, labor, and drive time, which then we can split into four payments or two payments or whatever makes sense. Using this tool, she was able to, like, I, I want to say revolutionize the department. I mean, we'll look at the numbers at the end, but I feel like um, it's been a game-changing experience. And and wait, I have to say this too. You know, I go out to give a job on perennials and I, my knee-jerk would be like, well, I don't know, it'll take a couple hours, let's charge $600, right? Whereas, you know, once she filled out this tool, oh, $1,800. <laughs> That's a big difference. And it's really hard to go to a customer who paid you $600 last year and be like, hey guys, we'd love to come back and spray your tea trees. This year, it's gonna be $1,800. So the way we got around that is we, we we used the real numbers that we would need to charge to be viable or profitable, and then gave customer discounts for ongoing customers to kind of ease that transition. And for new customers, we just used the real numbers. Um, and our hope is that eventually, you know, everyone paying for this service is actually gonna be paying enough to make it worth our while. Um, here's some perennials team folks. Uh, this is Sarah showcasing our Tyvek suit. Um, these are just some examples of the kind of jobs that we're looking at. So here's a here's a great integrated food garden right after it got planted, um, compared to something here which has been you know more established. Um, it's really beautiful work and it's really fun. You know we do a lot with different native pollinators. Um, we do plant cultivated. We don't. We're not straight species. Um, extremists, um, and that does come from me. I think some of my staff would be happier if we only did straight species, but I'm a sucker for color. Um, yeah, we've started doing these gator bags on trees. Tree diapers are another solution. We find particularly with shallow rooted things like blueberries that you could plant it best in the world and right off into the distance. And if they don't water it consistently, they're probably gonna call you in a few weeks and be like, my blueberry bush died. So having some, you know, from the get go irrigation on it really makes a difference. Here's the front of the house garden that we did. Um, this is an example of a guild garden. This is a scenario where we took a card from the permaculture deck, right? The concept of a guild garden that has, you know, a, a, a tall tree, a short tree, a tall bush, a short bush, and a, and a uh, ground cover and and put it into an actual individual product so and this is a a single guild garden in which we have a fig tree as the central species we have two blueberry bushes and then we have i think six or nine pollinators uh, and insectary plants all of which are both calculated to bring in uh, pollinators repel pests and also look cool because you know as you can see this is something that we plop down right in front of someone's house Here's an herb spiral that we did for a recent customer. We've done a few herb spirals over the years. I've definitely done them out of all different stuff. You know, I've hacked up giant tree trunks 
I've used bricks, I've used found materials. This guy, you know, is natural stone that fit the rest of his front of house landscaping. Um, and here's an example of a guild that's a little bit more established. You can see here in the background, a pink currant bush, a blueberry bush, an echinacea flower, a comfrey flower, a raspberry trellis behind it. Um, this is from our demo garden, and I frankly just included it because I just love the light on those uh, Monarda fistulosa, which is a great native pollinator. And right, we're in it for the fruits and berries. I mean, there's nothing like bright blueberries and figs to make it all feel worth it. Um, plug for using herbs as edible landscaping plants, probably my favorite thing. I use them everywhere I can. They bloom, they attract pollinators, deer don't eat them, they're beautiful. And then at the end of the day, you can cook with them. Um, here's some hardy kiwis. You may have planted hardy kiwis and you may be wondering, why are they not fruiting? They take a really long time to fruit. So we were really excited when we started seeing fruit on these. Um, and here's some guild gardens. Again, you know, in this case, there's deer pressure. So we put um, fences around them. And shade garden, a harvest basket, and Malachi digging up some potatoes. Actually, I think he's planting potatoes here, so it's supposed to offset that picture at the beginning. All right, guys. So that's the three departments that we had that we have that we are broken into. Now I want to take it to the next level, and I want to talk about the big picture. And I I do feel a little vulnerable sharing num numbers, but I do have here a spreadsheet of the business numbers, and insofar as they're relevant to the big picture, thinking about this type of business um, for the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, years of the business. I did start the business in 2020, 2014, but there was no revenue that year. So like I said, I started this very low, low stakes and low tech, right? Just me and a pickup truck. Uh, I think in my first or second year, I started hiring people under the table or slash 1099 just to, you know, help a little bit with labor. You can trace the gross income. And this is one of the things that I do feel really proud of and that I do think, you know, speaks to this industry as being a viable and excited, exciting industry. Like these numbers are not with, right? We're not really doing much marketing. We don't have any sort of funding and yeah, no marketing, no funding. So this is just, this is just natural growth, right? Year one, 20,000, 40,000, 80,000, 150, 190, 300, 400. And this year, we're going to wrap up the year with somewhere in the 530, maybe, depending on how things pan out. Um, so we're talking about a half million business in terms of gross sales, which feels exciting and viable. Um, just in terms of how we have that broken down, remember I talked about the, um, I talked about the three departments. So that translates here if you go down to the third. This is actually a little bit um, confusing, which, yeah, business stuff is confusing. We've got here installs and maintenance instead of builds, perennials, and annuals. You can slice them both ways, but this is an older budget model I was working off. So, you know, this installation includes both perennials and builds, and this maintenance includes both annuals and perennials maintenance. So those numbers you can kind of just step over. Um, but one thing that I did want to highlight as we, no, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Let's just go through these numbers. Okay, so great. That was our gross sales, right? Looks great. Now, look at the net profit line. That's the one right below the gross sales. Now, I'm not going to try, I'm not even going to give you a disclaimer for this one. I'm not going to justify it. I'm not going to apologize for it. I'm just going to share it to the best that I've been able to capture these details. And to be perfectly honest with you, this is not a forte. This is a thing that the business has grown and either done better or worse at, depending on who was helping me with it in terms of capturing data, right? So in this case, the net profit, you can see this line. This is a much sadder line, right? This year, negative 78. Second year, $6,000. Third year, $20,000. Fourth year, I think that I wanted to show you here. Total gross income. Yes. Okay. So the first four years, I was I was just taking owner's draw. Basically, what was left at the end of the year is what I got to take home. Right. I wasn't taking an actual salary during the course of the year, and you can see that culminates here at the end of 2018. It looks like I made forty five thousand dollars. To be honest, I'm not sure how true that is. Like 
you know, that some of that may be have actually just been the numbers at the bottom, that half of that went towards vehicle payments or what have you. But that's what it looks like. And then in 2019, you can see that my net profit was negative $20,000. Uh, 2020, net profit was 4,000. 2021 was really confusing because on one hand, we wound up the year showing a loss of $35,000, even after bringing in 400,000. But then we got a PPP loan for $35,000. And so basically at the end of the day, which was forgiven. And so at the end of the day, we broke even. Um, this year, I have currently, this year, it looks like we're going to finish the year showing about $40,000 worth of net profit. Wow, Josh, you could say that sounds great. You're actually in business. Woohoo, right? Now we have to look at the next line. Um, and this is what I, you know, this is owner's compensation, right? So this is me, the guy with two kids and a mortgage and a couple of vehicle payments and a full time working wife. This is what I'm taking home from all of my hard work doing this year in, year out, weeks, weekends, days, nights, whatever it takes, right? So first year, I got negative $78. Second year, I got $6,000, theoretically. At the end of the year, that's 14% of gross. Next year, I got 22, which is 27% of gross. The next year, theoretically, I got 45, which was 31% of gross. This year that the business lost $20,000, I paid myself $38,000. Now, that's a bit of a like that that'll mess with your head right that's a little bit confusing to think about where did i get it we have a line of credit right so we have a line of credit which i'll talk about in a minute which is what gets us through the winter season so if you see like well how did you pay yourself if you didn't actually have that money i assume it had to do with that in 2020 i have a record of showing that i paid myself more than i ever have which was sixty-eight thousand dollars, and at the bottom at the end of the day the business showed us four thousand dollar profit um which is a little confusing to me then in 2021 i paid myself 63. now these two years i was paying myself an actual w-2 salary together with all the staff so on one hand that's really great and it's really it really it's like oh wow i'm here i've arrived i get a paycheck right i get a w-2 what my accountant my new accountant because i had to get a new accountant at the end of that year said to me as he said josh you're paying double the taxes on every paycheck you pay yourself you're paying both the employer and the employee paycheck taxes so you only have to take a certain amount as salary and the rest you should take as owner's draw because ultimately the big tax picture is going to wind up as a break even and you're going to pay less taxes that way so i'll flag that it's a little bit over my head but that's what he said and so this year i took not very much. I took thirty thousand as in salary, and then have been paying myself back in owner's draws to the sum of around fifty k. I'll be honest. If we end the year here with this forty thousand of extra, I'll probably take some of that to be my end of the year. You know, to garnish my end of the year salary, so that it's more like sixty. But that's pretty much like I'm. I'm not making the big bucks, right? We've got. We've got ten employees. We've, you know, we're bringing in five, you know, half a million dollars, and um, I'm paying my mortgage, but not exactly floating vacations to, uh, I don't know, Mauritius, right? Um, so just, you know, just to put things in perspective, how things have worked out for me, I do want to just flag this line because this is going to lead me to the last area that I want to talk about: payroll and the percentage of gross sales that is payroll, right? So if you follow this line across, obviously in the early stages, barely at all, then you know some casual labor for the next three years, either, right, just like folks coming to help plant or what have you. And then really starting in 2019, when we started having actual payroll and stuff, you know, that payroll is, is generally, and also this could be like a year transition. I mean, you could say that it was 55% or 54% of gross sales across the board for the past four years. So, that's, uh, I think that's rough. I actually don't know which child that is. It's one of the children when it was born. Um, and I wanted to end on this slide because, you know, a business is like a baby. <laughs> but I guess where I wanted to go with this is that um, to wrap this up, I wanted to talk a little bit more about that tension and that dis dissonance between the permaculture ideal and the capitalism reality. 
Um, I would say that the two biggest pain points for me in terms of where I'm sitting right now, nine years into it, there's two of them. One of them is that, and, and this is a really painful thing. I, really, I'm not saying this to discourage anyone, but I do think that it's it's tough medicine that you need to hear if you're considering going down this road. And that is that if you want to have a small edible land or an edible landscaping business or a permaculture design business, if you want to go down that road of saying like, yes, I believe that small business is a more nimble, impactful way of addressing the world's challenges than a big bloated nonprofit, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to make a small business, what you need to know up front and really know up front is that what that means, what you're signing up for, is to be in small business. It doesn't matter if you're you know, poaching baby seals, or if you're an accountant, or if you're fixing trucks, or if you're doing edible landscaping, because as beautiful as those pictures are, and man, let me tell you, I am proud of these pictures, right? I mean, these are beautiful. We've done so much beautiful work. And ultimately, I am grateful that I have built myself a job that gives me both the opportunity to work on, uh, on work that I'm passionate about, to share you know, the things that I believe in with customers, and the flexibility of being a small business owner. So like, yeah, that's right. When they call from the school, which they do every 15 minutes saying, come pick up your kid because he's sick or because it's a holiday or because it's raining or whatever, you know, generally I can drop things and go do that as much as it's frustrating. Um, but the trade-off is that small business is a flipping cliche, guys. I mean, we're talking about HR and we're talking about, you know, we're talking about accounting and we're talking about taxes and we're talking about like, organizational systems you know i'm not an organizational system i i want to be a guitar bum right i want to plant blueberry bushes i want to like make jam like you get me into the room you know to negotiate pto with like a resentful employee that's making me into the man and blaming me for everything that's gone wrong in their life and it's judging me according to an industry that is predicated on exploitation i'm really not having fun right? That is not really what I signed up for. And I think that there's genuine tension in how big of a team you want to cultivate, what type of business you want to grow, and who, what are your personality traits? Like, where, where is your sweet spot, your, your joy spot when it comes to what your work looks like every day? So I'll just, I want to end by kind of sharing what we do in terms of uh, our pipeline, because that's really where much of my work is. When people reach out to us through our website, we use Squarespace for our website. I have no complaints. I mean, I think it's a good tool. I like our website. Um, and it's relatively easy to work on. When people reach out through our website, they say, hey, we want Edible Eden to come do a thing. We want a vegetable garden. We want a fruit tree. We want a pollinator garden. I'm curious about transforming my lawn, whatever it is. We respond and we say, great. We start working with new customers at an initial consult. And that initial consult costs between $200 and $500, depending on where you are and um, what you're looking for. And that typically to date has been me, right? So once they book that, I get in my car and I drive out to their house and I spend up to an hour and a half with them, basically bringing my passion, my skill set, and my 25 years of experience with plants, agriculture, and sustainable design to your property, right? And, and I incorporate my journalism stuff, right? I find out who you are and who lives here and who does the cooking and what your lifestyle is like and how much money you want to spend on this, right? And then I analyze the property and I say, okay, like what are my permaculture sectors? And, you know, where's the sun coming from? And where's the slope going to? And where's the water sitting? And, and what's growing here now? And then I connect those two things and I put that all into a proposal based on what we could deliver, right? So we could build a raised bed garden for you. We could plant blueberry bushes for you. We could do a food forest over here, what have you. I put that in a contract and in a proposal, which is broken down, it looks like a menu. And I send that to the customer. The customer comes back and says, great, or at least let's say 50% of the time. They say, great, I wanna get items number two, three, and four, right? Two raised beds, a trellis and irrigation, two fruit trees and a blueberry run. I say, great, we turn that into a contract. We get them to sign the contract. We then extrapolate a work order, which goes to the Google Drive where the team can access it. And then the team either builds, installs, or maintenance can take that and run with it. I want to flag that as a pain point. For years, I have been trying to set up a tech system that would do that pipeline, that would go from 
you know, that would first of all give me a efficient tool to go on that consult and just click, 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 and spit out a, a, a pretty proposal on letterhead, and that they could then click, click on that, and it would spit out a contract, and then they could online execute it, and it would spit out a work order, and that could get put into the right file, and we could run with it. And then at the end, we want to be able to capture the data: how many hours do we spend, how many materials do we use, etc. Um, so, I have failed today. Sorry, we don't, we don't use the failure word. I have not succeeded to date in finding a tech tool for that solution. I've talked to startups on the West Coast and, and, and forms people. I've talked to like individual guys that said they could like buy three different softwares and stitch them together. You know, I've, I've not gotten in deep, but I know that there are all these like big landscaping softwares that you pay thousands and thousands of dollars for, and then you have to have trainings on them. And then they basically capture all of that in one big entity. Um, I have not pulled the trigger on that. And, you know, we're still churning around with the, you know, okay, I'm going to type it up in Word. Okay, I'm going to export a PDF. Okay, I'm going to send it for signing, right, for each contract. I want to flag that as a bottleneck to scaling. Like before we would, if we were to get much bigger, we would need to have something that just kind of streamlines that process. Um, oh, here we go. This is the other things I wanted to share, right? So we use paychecks for payroll. Um, I am not going to be, I'm not going to tell you, I think it's a great, I mean, it costs an arm and a leg and it is constantly frustrating and they're always trying to sell me things from different people who are, you know, part of different departments. It literally makes me queasy to think about how much money I spend on it, but I also haven't come up with a better solution. And here's the thing for the people just starting out. This is a really important consideration at the beginning because I got to tell you the thought of starting from scratch with another entity is almost not worth whatever financial savings that we would ultimately realize, right? So that's really, like when you take the time and effort to get something this complicated set up and operational, you really don't want to change it because the next guy gives you a 5% discount, right? So that's a real consideration in setting up this stuff. We use QuickBooks for accounting. Again, I don't like it, but I think of it as the industry standard, and, I, and I'm aware that I could use it a lot more effectively if and when I or other people on my team can really get into the nuance of how to grow, uh, how to use it more effectively. Um, it was exciting this year to set it up to track the classes. So I, I am aware that there's a lot more functionality that it could bring to the table. And I said Squarespace for the website and Google Drive for all of the communications and documents. We use small PDF to send out the contracts for signing. And then I have an insurance agent that I work with to get all the insurances and stuff um, in terms of liability insurance and uh, vehicles. We do a pay workers' comp through paychecks. So, you know, that's where I wanted to pull things together here at the end, which is that, well, I want to flag two things. First of all, there's a difference in management and leadership, and it's really hard to do both. And I think I'm a lot better at the latter and a lot less good at the former. Right. So I spend most of my time doing those consults and writing up proposals and, you know, like finalizing jobs with customers, which I then hand off to the team. And the times in which I have to be in an HR setting in which I have to be that one that is receiving, you know, disgruntled employees frustration or resentment, you know, being told that they need to get a lot more money and they need to get a lot more time off and they need to get a lot more benefits and where's the health insurance and I promised and, you know, all while taking home 50K and breaking even. Um, it's very hard for me to separate out my personal, my personality, my, I get defensive and I feel, um, and I feel like, yeah, I feel like, why am I doing this? Like, why am I in this seat? You know, what I've come to, what I'm starting to understand is that an effective manager, which I have had, by the way, um, is an amazing thing because they they could basically do that without taking it personally right just be like great what's the industry standard okay this is what we can answer josh this is what we need to offer great let's set it up create a policy boom right but for me i'm like mired in like oh but this is my baby here let's go back to the baby right like you're basically yucking my yum you're telling me that i'm a bad person you know i'm trying to do right i mean oh, i'm trying to do good in the world and like what i'm getting from you is like you're resentful and angry and like working out your forgive me, but daddy issues on me, and I'm the man. I'm really not the man, guys. <laughs> um, but if you start a small business, and if you have a 10 of 10 people, and if you own it, then guess what? 
you are the man or the woman or the whatever you are. Um, and that may not be the professional career path that you want. So I guess where I'm trying to go with all this and the, and the, you know, the things that I'm really thinking about and grappling with are what is the best size business for me to run? Like, do I need to be sitting at a table of 10 people? Or actually, if I had four really bought in staff that I was able to pay top dollar to and get health insurance for all of us and be really nimble and charge a lot for what we do and make a good margin compared to, well, I've got a team of 12 and I need to bring in a million dollars with a, you know, with a 2% margin or whatever. Like this stuff really impacts your quality of life and the reality factor of you being able to do this as a living if you're trying to like raise kids and pay a mortgage and you know live more of a conventional scraping towards middle class lifestyle. Um, so I think I'm just about out of time here. I um, I want to flag one other challenge with HR, which is just the seasonality of the business and the nuance of if people are laid off over the winter and if as a result you then lose them versus if you pay them over the winter, but then how do you pay them over the winter if you have no income coming in and what exactly are they doing that's leading to better income during the year? And I do think one thing that you should consider is that it is as far as I can tell, it's impossible to do that unless you've been able to secure a line of credit. Um, you know, having a line of credit is what fills, that's what makes payroll in January if you've got no income in January. And then, you know, traditionally in years past, we've been able to, you know, go into debt until the end of February and then pay it off by the end of June. So I think that is pretty much what I wanted to say. I mean, I'm sure there's a ton more that we could talk about. A lot of this stuff is really live for me. Like I'm very much grappling with what kind of lifestyle it is that I want. You know, on one hand, I've created this job for myself that, you know, for all intents and purposes on good days, I, it really takes advantage, like it harnesses the best of what I have to offer. And it gives me both the flexibility and I don't have a boss and I get to drive around meeting people and talking about permaculture and, you know, still make my mortgage payment at the end of the day. And that is a huge privilege that I'm super grateful for. And at the same time, I recently did reach some burnout and seriously look into what it would take to get out of having a business like this. And I did a ton of research and I talked to business brokers and I talked to lawyers and I talked to accountants and I talked to other landscapers and I talked to large landscapers and small landscapers. And I really went through what it would take to sell this business. This is a half million dollar business for all intents and purposes, generating a 10% margin. The answer to the question, guys, if you it, just to save yourselves the, the labor, the answer to the question is you could, at the very best case scenario, sell it for around $75,000, of which 35% would go on taxes. If you use a broker, 10 to 15 would go to the broker, five would go to the lawyer. If you have any debt, in my case, I have 15 that I still owe on some of the vehicles. And basically, I would walk away with enough to buy myself breakfast. So not to take the wind out of anyone's sails, but that's a real consideration. Like if you do this for 10 years, are you prepared to then just quit? Or is there some path forward that will allow a business like this, you know, in the messy middle to continue to grow and thrive? Because the bottom line at the end of the day is that there are some amazing people working for Edible Eden and, you know, they're getting paid. Sorry, I didn't mention this, but the, the pay scale is between 18 and $25 an hour. They're getting uh, this coming year, everyone will have two year, two weeks of paid time off. They have a retirement account. This next year, we're going to start offering matching. We did not do that last year, and no one signed up for it. And we offer paid holidays um, somewhere between three and five. We're still hashing that out. So I guess where I wanted to wrap this up is, uh, that was a bit of a distraction, where I wanted to wrap this up is that Edible Eden is doing amazing work in the world. It is supporting, you know, up to 10 employees based on what point of the season, some of whom are, you know, making 24 and 25 bucks an hour, and they're doing really meaningful, really wonderful work in the world with very little supervision and a ton of flexibility. And 
And that's not nothing. Like that's a really great thing. So, you know, when I bounced back from trying to sell the business to well, I need to just pull the plug and sell off the vehicles, I I felt like I couldn't do that. I felt like the business has too much value in it, both for the people working for it and for the customers and for the world. And for me, so my path forward, which I'm happy to talk to anyone who's curious about talking about this later, my path forward is to seek to grow the stability of the business and to step back myself from operations such that I can spend more of my time, you know, doing the things that I want to do next, which involve more teaching and more consulting and more kind of solo work and, you know, work to stabilize the team and the HR systems and an effective manager such that those people can keep doing their job and keep um, providing the amazing services that we are offering to the world. They don't have to lose their jobs just because I want to do something else with my time, which I'm still figuring out. So um, that's where I'm going to wrap up. Uh, it's a little... I'd love to take questions, but I do think I'll have an opportunity to address some of those during the actual conference, possibly on a panel. Um, also, feel free to email me at josh at edibleedenfoodscapes.com uh, edible if you want to follow up on any of these things that we're talking about. Obviously, you can tell I like talking about this stuff. I've been doing it for the past nine years, and I believe in it. So I will wrap up there and... Uh, wish you all best of luck on your paths and much abundance in 2023.